We also have uh, uh, Tariq Rauf here, who is the former head of verification and security policy cooperation at the International Atomic Energy Agency. He served many years as an alternative head of delegation to the NPT review process meetings. And um, he's also one of the colleagues who I had pleasure to work uh, with uh, at the Center for Non-Proliferation Studies in Monterey at some point. But he, he also represented the Canadian government at the, uh, was member of the delegation at various NPT meetings uh, starting with 1987. Uh, sorry for dating your topic. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and then to my left is uh, Galha Muhajanova, who is the director of international organizations and non-proliferation program here at the VCDNP. Uh, she's focusing quite a bit on the non-proliferation uh, regimes and treaties, their operation and uh, their intersection between them, and uh, she has also had quite a bit of an experience serving on uh, various um, uh, <coughs> delegations in the review process, NPT review process. Um, for example, she served as a non-governmental advisor on state party delegations to the NPT review conferences in 2010, 2015, 2022 and also served as a non-governmental uh, advisor on the delegation of Chile to the DPNW um, negotiations. Not here yet, but will be here hopefully in the moment, is Laura Rockwood, who probably doesn't need much of introduction, particularly for the Vienna of, uh, audience, but she's uh, our own VCDNP senior fellow. Uh, she was previously executive director at the Open Nuclear Network. At some point, she was also executive director of the VCDNP. But he's mostly, she's mostly known in our field as a queen of safeguards because of her uh, long career with the International Atomic Energy Agency, where she headed, um, was headed, headed section for non-proliferation policy in the Office of Legal Affairs and participated in uh, various negotiations when it involved any of the safeguards issues or related issues. And, and some of the initiatives that went even beyond that, like the trilateral initiative that I'm sure we will hear a little bit today. With that introduction, I'm very pleased to uh, give first the floor to Ambassador Delhigi. Del, please. Thank you very much, Elena, and thanks to the VC, DNP, and also the Austrian Foreign Ministry for organizing this panel this afternoon. Good afternoon everybody. Thank you all for coming in whichever way you've chosen to come. And I've been asked to give you all a very brief overview of the provisions in the TPNW relating firstly to verification and then the twin positive obligations of victim assistance and environmental remediation. So I'm going to stick to my instructions and try to be brief. Firstly, verification. Article 4 of the TPNW provides, as I think everyone here probably knows, two routes for a nuclear weapon possessor state to come on board the treaty. You can either eliminate your weapons, then join, or you can join and then eliminate your weapons. Not surprisingly, both routes do entail verification obligations. Now, I'd like to recap quickly on the two routes and the verification framing for each. Route one, a state that joins the treaty after eliminating its nuclear weapons is required to cooperate with the competent international authority. That authority is to be designated also in due course under Article 4. To, competent, to cooperate with that authority for the purpose of verifying the irreversible elimination of its nuclear weapon program. That same authority is to report to states parties on this, as must also the state itself. The state we're talking about is also obliged to conclude no later than 18 months after it's joined the treaty, 
to conclude a safeguards agreement with the IAEA. These safeguards are to be sufficient to provide credible assurance of the non-diversion of declared nuclear material and of the absence of undeclared nuclear material or activities. These safeguards, at a minimum, are to remain in place, which is to say remain fully operative as an ongoing legal obligation. Now, on to Route 2. A state that joins the treaty whilst still owning, possessing or controlling nuclear weapons is required to immediately remove its weapons from operational status and destroy them as soon as possible, but not later than the deadline which was set by the treaty's first meeting of states parties, 10 years with an extension possible of a further five. It must do this in accordance with a legally binding time-bound plan for their verified elimination, which it must submit within 60 days of its joining the treaty. Now, as I just noted, both routes, Route 1 and Route 2, entail obligations which are to be verified. The obligation to verify is made very plain in the treaty, but the detailed process and standard for this is not. So, those of you who might wonder why not, I think the answer is pretty obvious. No state possessing nuclear weapons chose to take part in the negotiations for the TPNW, notwithstanding that every state was invited, if they had wanted to, to join in the negotiations. But in circumstances like that, it would have been an act, I think, of incredible hubris for non-nuclear weapon possessors to attempt to put in place the requisite detailed standards, none of which would have been applicable to them as non-possessors, and without an extended opportunity for considered technical input and scientific advice, something which is now available, including pursuant to the establishment of the scientific advisory group. You could just imagine, I think, the criticism, I think I'd use the word derision, from possessor states and their friends had we sought to do that during the UNGER negotiation time frame. So it was left for detailed verification measures to be worked out separately and subsequently. And in taking this approach, we were, of course, following in the well-worn footpath of the NPT, which also does not contain detailed verification provisions, and all of which were worked out by the IAEA committee set up for this purpose well after the NPT's adoption in 1968. I note too that the need for supplementary verification processes for the NPT is still under consideration even now, even after the adoption of the additional protocol in 1997. So the fact that our negotiators, the negotiators of the TPNW, took a leaf out of the NPT playbook by providing for the future development of a verification standard and mechanism, has not, however, prevented those looking for a reason to criticize the TPNW from indeed doing just that. I hope such criticism will not serve to hold back the IAEA with all its relevant expertise from engaging on treaty matters. Their input would be to the benefit, I believe, not just of TPNW states parties, but also the wider NPT community, given that the NPT places obligations on its parties also to advance nuclear disarmament. I'll leave two others here, most probably Tariq and Laura, if she gets through the traffic, to canvass the IAA's mandate and willingness 
to engage on TPNW matters, and so I will try to adhere to my writing instructions about being brief, and pass now on to victim assistance and environmental remediation. These positive obligations, as they are called for pretty obvious reasons, are set out in Article 6 of the Treaty. Article 6 has not, at least as far as I know, attracted the negative comment that some other aspects of the treaty, such as verification that we just talked about now, that those other aspects of the treaty have. I guess that's also for pretty obvious reasons. You'd have to be particularly foolhardy, I think, to want to cast dispersions on such an obviously well-intentioned endeavour one that, after all, seeks to improve the humanitarian plight of those who have been harmed by the use or testing of nuclear weapons and to remediate areas that have been contaminated as a result of such activities. I don't have to explain to you all just how horrific the consequences of nuclear testing, something that was thought at the time to be perfectly safe, have been for parts of the Pacific, both as regards its people and its places. Of course, the Pacific's not the only region affected. There are others in terms of testing, and Japan in terms of use. But because it's my own region, and because the harm there is so extensive, it comes most swiftly to my mind. Article 6 and also Article 7 on international cooperation and assistance are integral to delivering on the TPNW's humanitarian objectives. Provisions like this are entirely novel in the nuclear weapons context. A quick speed read of the entire seven pages of the NPT will serve to remind you that there's nothing in there at all on this. The TPNW is the first international framework to address the humanitarian and environmental impacts of nuclear weapon testing and use. So what do its articles say? Article 6 requires each state party to provide adequate assistance to individuals within its jurisdiction who are affected by the use or testing of nuclear weapons and to take necessary and appropriate measures towards the environmental remediation of areas under a state party's jurisdiction or control which have been contaminated as a result of these activities. Article 7 sets an obligation on those states parties in a position <coughs> to do so to provide technical, material and financial assistance to other affected states' parties in order to help them meet the obligations that the treaties put on them. <clears throat> I'm sure you can see just how carefully these two articles were negotiated. They had to balance the furtherance of humanitarian objectives with the need not to place a real barrier in the way of treaty membership and also without undermining existing relevant obligations which might already be owed under general international law or bilateral uh, arrangements by any other state. Of course, not everyone taking part in the negotiation agrees with just exactly how that balance was struck, but I can tell you that for New Zealand and for our Pacific region more generally, advancing the treaty's positive obligations is a priority issue. Usefully, the treaty has sparked broader consideration within our region and led now by the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat about nuclear legacy issues. Leadership of the intercessional work on positive obligations within the framework of the treaty is in the hands of our regional partner Kiribati and also Kazakhstan both the state's parties which have experienced the devastation of nuclear testing. And under their co-chairmanship, the direction is being set to give reality to the aspirations lying behind Article 6 and 7. The current focus of the informal working group is on the establishment of a trust fund for affected states. At this point, I would also wish to make it clear that my country very much welcomes the indications we received 
about the possible interest of a number of non-TPNW parties also contributing to such a trust fund when it is established in order that they too can help ameliorate the humanitarian consequences of the past use or testing of nuclear weapons. Thank you all. Thank you, Dallin. It's very interesting clarification you made regarding the uh, contributions that could go towards uh, including non-members. I think it's important, but thank you for giving us a, an overview of all these different articles and what it means in terms of uh, further work for the treaty, developing different provisions and um, uh, state parties, member, member states um, working on putting more uh, specifics into some of these uh, articles and um, provisions. Now with a co to the co-chair of the Institute Advisory Group, Zia, it's uh, looking forward to hear from you. Thank you. Um, so thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm grateful to VCDMP for the opportunity to have this conversation with uh, colleagues here and online. So as uh, Elena explained at the beginning, the decision was made at the first meeting of states parties to uh, establish a scientific advisory group um, for uh, the treaty uh, states parties. And for those of you who are interested in um, the background and concept that went into that, um, the decision was based on a president's paper by Ambassador Alex Clement that was prepared for the first meeting of the state's parties. And you can find that in the proceedings of uh, one MSP. Um, and it lays out the arguments for having such a scientific advisory group and um, the kinds of questions and roles that it might play. And um, I also have to say that this was a proposal that was first made by some of us at Princeton several years ago um, as part of trying to inform the uh, TPNW process um, based on the importance that uh, science and scientific expertise and advice um, and current scientific understanding was able to play in the humanitarian conferences that led up to the TPNW, where the focus on uh, bringing nuclear weapons down to earth, so to speak, and what they actually do to people and planet was a central part of the narrative and moving it away from the strategic abstractions of deterrence where nobody ever actually gets hurt. Um, so with that in mind, we had proposed that there would be a continuing role for scientific advice in the TPNW process going forward, however it was to be set up. And the uh, state's parties saw fit to establish this group. And the uh, appointment was were made in February of this year um, based on nominations by TPNW state. So it is actually a, a treaty-created organization and as such, it may well be the first standing scientific body specifically mandated to advance nuclear disarmament established by a treaty. Um, the decision was that it would be made up of 15, up to 15 members um, and that it would be geographically diverse and gender balanced. And um, so we actually now do have uh, members from 13 countries representing a diverse range of scientific uh, expertise. And it covers disarmament science, as well as people with experience in the practice of uh, safeguards, and people who have uh, specialized in understanding the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapon testing and use. People who think about the risks of uh, current nuclear weapons policies, but from a scientific and technical point of view, rather than international relations theory point of view. And um, as Elena mentioned, I am one of the two co-chairs. The other co-chair is uh, someone who many of you may know, Patricia Lewis, who is a physicist and was formerly the head of UNIDIR, um, 
the Ewan Institute for Disarmament Research and is now uh, at Chatham House in London and has had a very long and distinguished career in studying nuclear disarmament verification and supporting the use of science for uh, nuclear policy making and international processes. Our first meeting was in uh, March of 2023 and uh, there are specific tasks that the scientific advisory group has been assigned by the state's parties in that decision to establish us, but there's also a significant degree of autonomy that has been given to the group to um, help in the process, and I want to take a, a few minutes to talk about some of those things. One of the core missions uh, of the scientific advisory group is to assist states in implementing the treaty, and so it's for them to ask the scientific advisory group for things that they feel that they would re they need um, further analysis on to be able to uh, continue their decision making process as they take implementation of the treaty forward. It also recognizes that, that this is not a short term process, that this is an ongoing process of interpretation of uh, the world, the challenges of nuclear weapons and uh, of verification, as Dell mentioned, of the positive obligations of the treaty. And also to think about how um, science can continue, continue to contribute to the nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation discourse more widely from the perspective that is being developed and is under development as part of the TPNW. So it, it is also to introduce a, an organized scientific community and voice um, into this process beyond the TPNW but where the TPNW is part of the broader regime of nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation processes. So one of the specific things that we're actually required to do is to provide advice in particular on the scope and technical standards for uh, the Article 4 obligation with regard to irreversible, uh, legally binding uh, elimination of nuclear weapon programs and nuclear disarmament verification. And here, it's important to recognize that the TPNW breaks new ground by framing it in terms of the elimination of nuclear weapon programs, not just the elimination of nuclear weapons. And that raises questions about how to think about the larger scientific and technical question of nuclear weapon programs and their irreversible elimination. And that is an ongoing research question that um, states that seek to join the treaty with nuclear weapons will also have to grapple with as part of their disarmament also. And so it's to have uh, a base within the TPNW for having that conversation with states with nuclear weapons when they're ready to join about what is it that we're trying to achieve together here. Another key part of the goal of the scientific advisory group that the member states have set is to actually identify and engage with scientific and technical institutions in states parties to the treaty and more broadly and to actually establish a global network of experts to support the goals of the treaty and the treaty itself. So in that sense it's also a goal of building a scientific community anchored in and around the TPNW's goals of a humanitarian perspective on the abolition of nuclear weapons and prohibition of nuclear weapons, the elimination of nuclear weapon programs, um, and to build capacity in uh, states' parties. And the uh, way that that capacity building is framed is important in, the, in that it seeks to bring together scientists with expertise in the scientific advice group to reach out and engage with scientists, uh, scholars, civil society organizations, as well as communities affected by nuclear weapons in the past about the treaty, about the implementation of the treaty, and about the issues of the humanitarian and cons uh, consequences and risks uh, and responses to the treaty. So it's seen as part of an active cooperative engagement between the scientific community and the society's um, scientific, academic, um, within and the communities affected within TPNW states so that there is a shared understanding of what we're trying to do together 
and to take that process forward in a collective way, rather than have scientists parachute in and say, we have brought the answer to you, so just do what we say. It's about bringing everybody in together in this process. Um, the states also recognize that there will be questions that they have specifically uh, that they want answers to. And so the mandate of the scientific advisory group actually includes responding to requests from state parties, meetings of states parties, TPNW review conferences, and so on, um, to provide advice and make recommendations on specific issues that they're looking for relevant to the treaty, its implementation, and to nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation more widely. So states can actually ask the scientific advisory group to help them think through what else is going on in the disarmament and non-proliferation space that they should be engaged with and how to uh, take cognizance of some of those processes. Um, so it's not as narrow as some people may think in terms of just the implementation of specific uh, obligations of the treaty. But, and I'll wrap up here, a couple of specific last points. One is that since um, there will be new ground that has to be broken in terms of thinking about um, some of the implementation issues of the treaty, uh, as Dell mentioned, then the scientific advisory group is um, asked to assess and report on proposed approaches and methods for implementation. So it's not just that they have to provide suggestions for possible approaches and methods, but also to give feedback on proposals by others with regard to how the treaty may be implemented going forward. And that will include the proposals that states who choose to join the TPNW having had nuclear weapons or currently possessing nuclear weapons with regard to their plan for disarmament and the elimination of their nuclear weapon programs. So the scientific advisory group will have a role to play in thinking through what might be in those plans and to help states come to terms with those plans, as well as the competent international authority or authorities that are established to negotiate those plans with the states that join with nuclear weapons and fulfill their obligations. So there's a lot to do. And um, there's a question about how this is to be done. So practically, what we've done so far is to focus on the specific questions that uh, we've been required to think about in the short term and organize the scientific advisory group into working groups to address specific questions. And one of those questions was to submit a report to the second meeting of states parties, which will be in November in New York, um, about the current status of nuclear weapons, nuclear weapon risks, humanitarian consequences, and disarmament. And so uh, we have established a working group that takes those four specific sets of questions and is organizing uh, research that will go into that report to go into two MSP. Um, the second specific thing that is required by the second meeting of states parties is to begin the process of creating a network of experts and institutions from states parties and more broadly to support the goals of the TPNW. Wow. So we have a working group that's set up now and has started work on um, managing that process of uh, identifying and engaging experts and institutions together with colleagues uh, elsewhere in the scientific community, international organizations, and so on, so that we do have uh, the scientific advisory group plugged in into the broadest possible network of scientific colleagues and institutions within states, parties, and more broadly, to bring the collective capacity of the scientific community to support the goals and implementation of the TPNW. And so let me stop there and be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Zia. Uh, that looks quite a very, <laughs> quite a big agenda and, and set of issues. Just to quickly clarify, how big is the uh, scientific advisory board at the moment? How many members? We it was established with fifteen members, 15. and those fifteen members are drawn from thirteen countries. Okay. Thank you so much for that clarification. Uh, before I give the floor to uh, other speakers of the panel. 
Just a reminder to those who joined us online, um, you're welcome to send your questions to the panelists through uh, events at vcdnp.org email address. Uh, and we will, and also through Zoom, if I assume, so that we will try to accommodate, uh, but we'll see how we manage to do that. Um, I'm pleased Laura was able to make it here, but we will start uh, with uh, Tariq Rauf um, and probably go into looking more into the IA because we, we understand fully that the, there are safeguards uh, obligations under the treaty and where there, there also uh, probably some potential role for the IA exploring a potential role in the verification of disarmament issues. We want to look at both the mandate, but also past experiences uh, um, in these issues. We'll, we'll start with you, Tarek, and then uh, uh, Laura will um, continue. So thank you very much, uh, Elena, and I'd like to thank Austria, New Zealand, and uh, BCDNP for organizing this uh, important discussion. The TPNW is creeping closer to this building over there, the IAEA, uh, although the first uh, meeting of states parties last year was at the Austria Center, which shares a corridor link to the IAEA, but that remains closed for, for a variety of other reasons. Um, so I thought I would talk more on the, some of the technical parts and leave the legal uh, issues and other issues to, to Laura. Um, so IAEA statute specifically does allow for the IAEA to be involved with the policies of the United Nations for furthering the establishment of safeguarded worldwide disarmament in conformity with any international agreements entered into pursuant to such policies. And therefore, the IAEA provides the verification, as was mentioned by Delhegi, for the non-proliferation treaty, but also for five nuclear weapon-free zone treaties. Uh, and also, of course, as has been mentioned, the TPNW also includes uh, provisions for uh, comprehensive safeguards to be implemented within states that uh, join the treaty uh, after uh, destroying their own uh, nuclear weapon stockpiles or joining the treaty and then engaging into this plan to uh, verifiably uh, eliminate their nuclear weapons. Also, the, under the objectives of the IAEA and the statute, it does have the uh, authority to enter into safeguards agreements at the request of uh, any party, a, a state, bilateral or multilateral, uh, again, for the purposes of verification. So I think there should be no question that were the TPNW states parties to approach the IAEA to provide uh, expertise with regard to verification, uh, the IAEA does have the competence and the authority under its, its statute to, to do so. Uh, and I don't think it's, it would be useful <coughs> for board members to, to object to that because it then has implications for other international treaties uh, where uh, verification is provided for by the IAEA. The IAEA can also play a role with regard to victim assistance and environmental remediation. The IAEA has carried out uh, environmental surveys of uh, former test sites in Algeria, Australia, and the South Pacific. Uh, there's also the UNSCIA, which is the United Nations Scientific uh, Establishment on Atomic Radiation, which actually sets the standards for exposure, human exposure and environmental exposure to uh, ionizing radiation. And UNSCIA is also based uh, in the VNI International Center. It's a very small organization of very few people. And then, of course, there's also the world health uh, organization uh, on that side. I would like to make a distinction between uh, disarmament and denuclearization. And I think these are two uh, parallel uh, objectives as regards the TPNW, as Zia just mentioned. So it's not only the disarmament of existing nuclear weapon stockpiles, but also denuclearization, which means the elimination of the nuclear weapon programs and the nuclear weapons infrastructure or establishment or enterprise in states that uh, have made uh, nuclear uh, weapons. The IAEA, of course, does have some experience. I should like to state here that the International Atomic Energy Agency is not the United Nations nuclear watchdog. The International Atomic Energy Agency is an autonomous international organization established both to promote the safe and secure uses of atomic energy and also to prevent uh, its misuse for nuclear weapons purposes, and therefore the IAEA is autonomous in its own right, and perhaps Laura can uh, elaborate on that more 
uh, if she likes, in her um, comments. And also, IAEA inspectors are safeguards inspectors. They are not weapons inspectors, because they have not been uh, given the task of inspecting any weapons. There have been no international treaties that called for the elimination of weapons. The Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty and the new START and the previous START treaties are for the elimination of delivery systems and the removal of nuclear warheads, but not under bilateral verification, not under international monitoring and verification. But the IAEA does have experience, particularly with regard to South Africa, where South Africa had five complete uh, nuclear uh, operational devices. The sixth one was partially completed, and there was one demonstration device. So there were seven in all in different stages. Um, and the IAEA was called to do the verification of South Africa's unilateral dismantlement uh, before it joined the NPT. So here we have an issue because IAEA's uh, safeguards inspectors primarily are from non-nuclear weapon states, so the IAEA had to send an inspector uh, who was certified uh, with clearances with regard to nuclear weapons in their own home country, and in this case it happened to be a person called Robert Kelly who doesn't live very far out in, in Kloster Neuburg, who did the nuclear weapons related uh, verification. He also verified uh, the production records of special nuclear materials, SNM. He also verified the declaration by South Africa that the highly enriched uranium metal coming out of the dismantled nuclear warheads had been melted down and returned to the Atomic Energy Commission of South Africa. And he also produced a report for the Director General. Uh, he's published a paper for CIPRI in which you can hear, see the, the details. Then when it comes to Iraq, uh, we have already uh, still at the IAEA Shah boat. Also, it was Robert Kelly, there was Trevor Edwards, and others, but these were, again, um, uh, inspectors or nuclear engineers or nuclear chemists from nuclear weapon states that already had the clearance in their respective uh, states to deal with nuclear weapons issues, and so there was some so uh, sort of a, a barrier. So IAEA safeguards inspectors verified the civilian part of the program, and the, the inspectors from the nuclear weapon states dealt with the information dealing with nuclear weapons. Same thing happened with Libya, where uh, Jacques Bot and Robert Kelly examined the designs of nuclear weapons that were provided to Libya uh, by the International Nuclear Supply Network. So this, I think, will be an important distinction if and when the IAEA were to be called upon to provide verification in the context of the, of the TPNW. Uh, um, So the other difficulty with the IAEA might be uh, the board. So the Board of Governors is based on 35 members, and the statute, as you know, was negotiated in 1956, entered into force in 1957, and it divides the world into eight geographic areas. Uh, and from 1957 to now, there are many countries that have emerged as independent states and are no longer part of colonies or other amalgamated states. But many of these states are not part of the political groupings that have been established at the IAEA. So the board membership is not, is not so much done by the geographic areas, but by the political groupings of the Western group, the Latin American group, the Middle East and South Asia, the Far East, and so on. So for example, the five Central Asian countries and some others, they are, they are calling themselves homeless states because since they are not included in any group, they can never be on the Board of Governors because to be on the Board of Governors, you have to be nominated by a group. Furthermore, there are more countries that are now advanced in nuclear technology, and this was one criterion that the countries most advanced in nuclear technology in their respective geographic areas would serve continuously on the Board. So unlike the Security Council, the countries serving continuously on the Board do not have any special vote uh, if their vote is the same. But it means that, for example, uh, the United Arab Emirates, that has four reactors, uh, South Korea, that has 22 reactors, Pakistan has, I think, six, and others, uh, they also do not serve continuously on the board. So this was an issue that also came up when I was doing some briefings at the conference on disarmament many years ago when I was still at the IAEA. Uh, in terms of if the verification of a fissile material cutoff treaty or a fissile material treaty were given to the IAEA, all countries that did have weapon usable uh, nuclear material production facilities wanted to be represented on the governance structure for such a treaty. And I think that might also be the case with regard to, to the TPNW. This is an open question. I'm just putting it on the table uh, as something that uh, needs to be uh, dealt with. 
So there, there are two other um, uh, uh, experiences of the IAEA. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the technical parts. One is the trilateral initiative and the second. But that's you're talking about the legal side. I'm going to talk about the technical part. Uh, and then there's the plutonium management and disposition agreement that was the follow-on to um, uh, the trilateral initiative. So on the technical side, the, the big concern was how to make available nuclear material for the IAEA to be able to, in a sense, monitor and confirm that the material remained in the containers that it was uh, made available to the IAEA and for each of the two parties, the Russians and the Americans, to also get enough information that the contents of the material had not been changed. So this involved a lot of technical work and a number of concerns on the technical side for all three parties, Russia, United States, and the IAEA. One was information security, that no classified information uh, about the inspected, inspected sensitive item uh, would, would need to be protected and only be available to authorized users. Who defines what is classified information and at what point does, at what point does the classification begin? The second technical aspect was the certification, how to certify the technical integrity of the verification system. In this case, both the Russians and the Americans each made their own devices uh, which, uh, in which the nuclear material would be stored, and they made two devices each, and then they exchanged one each. Uh, so the Russians managed to reassemble the device made in Los Alamos, and I'm told that the US, for some reason, was not able to successfully reassemble the device provided by Russia built at the Sarov uh, nuclear facility. Uh, other aspect is authentication of the material. How do you authenticate that the material indeed is from the source that the party is claiming it to be? So in this case, it was supposed to be excess nuclear weapons uh, material and, and plutonium. So they came up with a number of technical aspects. Uh, but in the end, for political reasons, they were not able to agree. I happened to be at the meeting with the Director General Albara Day when he met with the um, uh, US Secretary of Energy, uh, Abraham, and his uh, Russian counterpart, the head of uh, Minatom or Rosatom, uh, Rumyantsev, and where they agreed that the first phase had been successfully completed, that technologies had been developed, but no material would be provided. Fast forward to 2010, when the IAEA gets identical letters from Secretary Clinton and from Foreign Minister Lavrov to fast track a monitoring mechanism for the reactor burnup of excess plutonium, 34 metric tons each. Uh, again, there were discussions with the IAEA, but again, the two sides could not agree on the starting point where the plutonium would get into the monitoring track and also some of the details of, quote unquote, the reactor uh, burn up and then the relationship went south so the, the agreement didn't go any further. I might recall that the very first nuclear security summit was held in 1996 uh, in Moscow. I was then commissioned by uh, the Atomic Energy Control Board, was still in Canada, to look at the burn up of mixed oxide fuel derived from plutonium from excess nuclear weapons for burn up in Canadian CANDU reactors. Yeah, so the pressurized heavy water reactor can burn these bundles uh, without much uh, change in reactor physics. Uh, a small amount of plutonium was brought to Canada for a parallax experiment where the IAEA would also be involved. The person who brought this plutonium shipment was none other than a person called Laura Holgate, who happens to be the current ambassador. I have a couple of questions for um, Zia, and, and then I will uh, wrap up. So Zia, you mentioned gender balance, but I see of the 15, only three are women. So it's so an interesting gender balance on the list here, right? Um, my second question is, uh, how many of these people have people who are um, scientists or who are actually nuclear engineers or nuclear chemists who have actually dealt with nuclear weapons, have been on a verification exercise, whether in terms of INF or New START or an IAEA inspection? Because uh, I still continue to believe, despite the International Partnership for Disarm Nuclear Disarmament Verification, Quad, the UK, Norway Initiative, and so on, that the most practical way forward is for each of the nine nuclear weapon states when they join the TPNW to dismantle their own nuclear weapons and then surrender the nuclear materials to an international inspector, probably the IAEA, for ensuring that it no longer returns back into the weapon cycle. Thanks. Thank you, um, Tariq. I, uh, we'll probably hold on to answering these questions towards the end, but 
actually I would like to add to that uh, is the overall uh, plan for engagement with the existing initiatives that focus on verification of disarmament, including IPNDB, with the Quad, and, and, and some others. Um, Laura? Happy to be here. Sorry about the UBAN. It was uh, a little delayed. God knows why. Um, what I was asked to do is, is focus specifically on two of the activities that relate to safeguards to try to give you some background, maybe some risk for the mill to take into consideration in the future. I think there are three obvious areas where there's some kind of a nexus between the TPNW and the IAEA. Uh, the most obvious one is the implementation of safeguards agreements. Obviously, there is a floor below, below which states are not permitted to go in terms of safeguards. I will voice my heartbreak at the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states not being required to have additional protocols, but that's a totally different issue. So I can give you the reason why not. I, I know why not. <laughs> anyway, uh, so safeguards is obvious, and that will continue to happen. There is the other aspect of disarmament verification. And finally, there's an area that I was looking into in preparing for this presentation, is what kind of relationship is there between the two 1986 Chernobyl conventions, the one on uh, early notification and the provision of assistance. Now, early notification uh, talks about early notification in, of a nuclear accident that has or may have transboundary radiological, uh, release of radio radiological radioactive material. Um, and there is a paragraph in there, uh, there's an article in there that allows states to, to undertake to provide notification in the event of something else that's not covered by the notification convention explicitly. And all five of the nuclear weapon states have undertaken to do so to the extent that it doesn't raise a problem for national security. So you might want to look into that. The assistance uh, convention doesn't seem to be, on its face, doesn't seem to be uh, tied to what causes the radiological emergency, nuclear accident or radiological emergency. I would imagine the active use of a nuclear weapon, probably not covered by that. Um, but whether the, the question is if there's an accident involving a nuclear weapon, maybe. So I just wanted to touch on that. So drilling down a little bit on South Africa, um, why are they important? South Africa is important not because it's, it's the only case in which we verified the correctness and completeness. Um, and indeed, in Iraq, we were able to verify dismantlement of the nuclear weapons program. But this was, South Africa was really the first case where the agency became involved in ex post facto verification that nuclear weapons had been dismantled and the nuclear material placed under IAEA safeguards. Uh, it was in November 1989 when the government of South Africa uh, decided to stop the production of nuclear weapons. They had, let's call them six and a half nuclear weapons. Uh, they had six actually completed. And the HEU core and some non-nuclear components were the <coughs> seventh one. They had two arms of the government that basically did this arms core, which did the delivery system mechanisms, the weaponization, and the Atomic Energy Commission, which was responsible for acquiring the nuclear material that would be used in the, uh, in the weapons program. We had a fabulous panel here some years ago with Doc Nick, who was the head of the AEC during this period. It's a book called The Bomb. It's about this thick, and uh, it's published in English. And if you want to know the real history, it's a fabulous book. So um, a, a few months later, three months later, President de Klerk issued a written instruction to his people that all existing nuclear devices were to be dismantled and the nuclear materials were to be melted down and returned to the AEC in anticipation of South Africa's accession to the NPT. So early the following year, um, South Africa became party to the NPT and at the end of 1991 concluded a standard comprehensive safeguards agreement with the IAEA. Both the Board of Governors and the General Conference adopted resolutions insisting that the Director General verify not just that their declarations were correct, 
but that South Africa's declarations were in fact complete. So when the inspectors first started going there, uh, they carried out their traditional ad hoc inspections to try to verify the declaration of nuclear material, the declaration of nuclear facilities. And while two of our inspectors were actually in South Africa, lo and behold, the South African government said, oh, by the way, we had six and a half nuclear weapons. One of those inspectors was also in India when, uh, when India tested their nuclear explosive device, the Smiling Buddha. We started to wonder about his presence in these companies, but anyway. So uh, what the agency did is uh, it had kind of shifted its task. Obviously, it was going to be a lot more complicated because there would have to be access to nuclear weapons relevant information. So they actually created a, a team of senior members of the department specifically appointed by the DG for this purpose. Um, and it did include nuclear weapons experts, in particular Bob Kelly, uh, other nuclear weapons experts from nuclear weapon states that had had security clearances in their respective governments and access to nuclear weapons information. So by the time the agency team visited in April 93 to do this, the dismantling and destruction of the weapons components and of the technical documentation had been nearly completed. Why do I emphasize that? We look at the plans. How long is it going to take? Now, South Africa didn't have anywhere near the scope of a nuclear weapons program of any of the other nine, um, at least of the five. So, but that gives you some kind of an understanding of how long it took them to dismantle. But how was the agency able to, ask, uh, to assess the status of the former program and make sure that nuclear material involved in the program had been recovered and placed under safeguards. It all started, as do all verification activities, with declarations. Obviously, the first is nuclear material and facilities. Interestingly enough, South Africa, which had previously had a very, very broad, unsafeguarded nuclear program, um, it, was, it wasn't a case where the agency had been following all these facilities all along. So some of these brand newly safeguarded facilities, including uh, uranium hexafluoride production plant, a pilot high enriched uranium plant, the so-called Y plant, um, HEU fuel fabrication plant, semi-commercial LEU enrichment plant, and a metal alloy and production plant. So to those of you who are somewhat familiar with the nuclear weapons program, uh, those kind of open your eyes and you think, those are the ones we really need to take a look at. The team's activities included uh, examination of contemporary operating and accounting records, but they also had access to the historical operating records of defunct facilities and the facilities themselves. Uh, they were also, uh, in the course of this uh, inspection routine, they had to resolve a number of apparent discrepancies between how much was declared to the agency um, and some of the operating records. So what they did is they went back and one of our inspectors, Rich Hooper, using pencil and paper, went back and compared the operating records of the entire history of the facility with what was expected to have been produced. So they were actually able to uh, assure the assure the world community that all the nuclear material used in the weapons program had been returned to peaceful use and placed under AG safeguards. A couple of things that I think would be relevant to TPNW. They assessed that all the non-nuclear weapon specific components had been destroyed, that the lab and engineering facilities had been decommissioned or abandoned or converted to peaceful use, uh, that the weapon specific equipment had been destroyed, and that all other equipment had been converted to commercial non-nuclear or peaceful nuclear use. So uh, they were able to assess the correctness and completeness of the information with respect to the timing and scope of its weapons program and the development, manufacture, and subsequent dismantling of the nuclear weapons, including a visit to the Kalahari test site to make sure that they were rendered useless. So South Africa, Trilat. 1996 to 2002, it was a Russian-initiated uh, initiative that was intended to be a feasibility study looking into 
the technical, legal, and financial aspects of IAEA verification of fissile material with classified characteristics. So most of the nuclear material that, well, the material that the IAEA currently safeguards um, doesn't, con doesn't involve nuclear material with weapons classified information. Sensitive information, sure, HEU, plutonium, yes, but not in the form that we would be able to ascertain classified information from it. Um, I know the risk of having been late is I have to hurry up and catch up. Um, so what we did is we created a joint working group, Russians, Americans, and the IAEA team, and we looked into what would be required to, uh, to place material with classified properties under agency safeguards, and we focused predominantly on weapons-grade material. We developed the technology for what Tariq described as attribute verification with information barriers. You put the material in a black box, you ask three questions. Uh, the three questions are, is it plutonium? Does it have a particular isotopic composition? Is it weapons grade? And is the mass of the plutonium greater than a specified threshold mass for the facility it's going to? If it's green, 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 it would be sealed, stored, uh, converted, and then re-verified and placed under safeguards un until such time as we were to agree it would be irreversible. One of the big things was how do you authenticate that equipment? The Russians wanted to take apart the equipment and then give it back to us if it was okay. But if they didn't like it, they wouldn't give it back to us and wouldn't tell us why it was okay. So obviously there was no way the agency could, could cope with that as a mechanism for, for authentication. So that was one big issue. And the other big issue was what do you mean by irreversible? And we negotiated almost all aspects of a model legal agreement that any state could use today to submit to the IAEA fissile material with classified uh, characteristics um, as, a, as a step in the direction of Article 6. In fact, Tom Shea and I wrote a couple of articles on this in anticipation of the 2015 NPT Review Conference and um, the Final declaration wasn't the only thing left on the floor at the end of that uh, at the end of that conference, but important to underscore the point that Terry made. Article 3A5 of the statute authorizes the agency to implement safeguards in connection with agency assistance, but also in connection with bilateral or multilateral agreements at the request of the parties, NPT, nuclear weapon free zone treaties or to any of the state's activities in the area of atomic energy. There is nothing in Article 3A5 that would prevent the IAEA from being tasked with this. Who tasks them? The board. The board would have to approve whatever mechanism that is beyond safeguards. Um, and that's where the rub is. And that's actually the final point I wanted to make. I just have to find my last page. I'm really very organized. Okay. Um, I think the initiative remains relevant today. The tools and the concepts are still relevant. Um, and what, what is important is that we don't wait for the political will to evolve, to enter into negotiations for an arms control agreement or for fissile material redu reductions. Uh, th there are lots of things that can be done. Solve the technical problems, and then you can bring the political people with you. That's what happened in the CTBT. Um, I think the agency could become, in, I think the agency has the authority and the ability to verify the nuclear material components of such a program, even nuclear material with classified characteristics. And some of the folks at uh, Princeton are working on better mechanisms for doing that, but I'm cautiously optimistic. But here's the problem. If you were to ask the agency to get involved with the dismantlement of the delivery systems or the actual warheads themselves, as opposed to the material taken out of it, I think it would change the very complexion of the IAEA. And this is me speaking in my own uh, voice. Uh, I, think, I think it probably should not be the exclusive 
CIA. Why did you guys use those initials? Uh, competent national uh, institution for the, for the dismantlement of the actual weapons themselves and the cores. And it might be productive, given the politics here in Vienna right now, to take this issue out of the context, not because there may not be a role, but because currently the issue is fraught in the context of the TPNW, although it is nice to hear that the conversations are more collegial than they were a couple years ago. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Laura. Uh, but uh, I think we are grossly behind the schedule. Uh, yet, uh, I really want to hear a little bit more about some other potential nexuses with other organizations and their work here in Vienna, particularly with respect to the CTVTO and Gaupar. Uh, hopefully, you will indeed stick to eight minutes, <laughs> <laughs> unlike all the previous speakers. <laughs> Maybe even less, who knows. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Eliana, and thank you, everybody. This was fascinating. Uh, and I will cover an, uh, cover an aspect uh, that's having to do with the prohibition on nuclear testing uh, and a little bit about more about the unscare that, that Tariq mentioned earlier. Now, uh, the uh, Article 4 and, and 6, 7, they don't cover uh, the, the prohibitions in, in the TPNW. And one of the prohibitions in Article 1 of the, of the treaty is the testing. Uh, there was some discussion during the negotiations about the scope of the prohibition and how to define testing, how to define nuclear weapons, and uh, in the end, the, the Article 1 simply prohibits testing as one of the activities of nuclear weapons and nuclear, uh, any other nuclear explosive devices. Uh, now, there already exists a treaty that prohibits nuclear testing, nuclear test explosions, or any other nuclear explosions in all environments everywhere in the world, and that is the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which was uh, negotiated by the Conference on Disarmament and opened for signature in 1996. And that treaty uh, has uh, provisions for a fair, very elaborate verification system, um, and um, and also establishes an implementing body, the, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization. And here's where the TPNW differs from CTBT, CTBT. While prohibiting nuclear testing of any kind, it does not establish any verification provisions for nuclear testing, in large part because verification system already exists under the CTBTO. Even though the CTBT is not in force since 1997, a provisional technical secretariat has been functioning here in Vienna and, and has been very successful in establishing the verification system, the international monitoring system that is 90% complete at the moment, com consists of more than 300 facilities of four kinds covering basically the entire world. And so even though the treaty is not in force, the, the CTBT, its verification system is almost uh, entirely functional minus the on-site verification, uh, on-site inspection uh, provisions. Um, and so here we have a bit of a dilemma, right? CTBT has rather dim prospects of entering into force in, in the near future, uh, but regardless, states parties continue to, so state signatories and ratifying states continue to support financially the maintenance of the uh, IMS, whereas TPNW is in force but does not have any verification provisions with regard to, to testing. Uh, during the negotiations, there was also a discussion of whether to specifically ask the states joining the TPNW to also join the CTBT, or act in accordance with provisions of the CTBT, much like the Central Asian Nuclear Open Free Zone does. Um, uh, ultimately, the negotiators decided not to go with that text, but they endorsed the importance of the CTBT and its verification regime in the preamble to the TPNW. So now the, the problem, I guess, the question here is not, is not necessarily even technical, but more political. How to better establish this link between a treaty that prohibits testing and is in force, and a system that is established pursuant to a treaty that's not in force, but is very successfully functioning. And here's a question, I guess, for MSP. The second MSP or subsequent MSPs, how can they more specifically frame the TPNW state's support for the verification system of the CTBT, whether or not the treaty is in force, so that we continue this kind of uh, very logical linkage between, between the two treaties and, and, and the two systems. In addition to that, of course, IMS has a lot of the 
scientific benefits going beyond ver verification and, and, and detection of nuclear testing. CTBTO is quite active in capacity building uh, in scientific research, uh, supporting especially in developing countries. And here, I, I think there is some room for the scientific advisory group uh, to, to, to have uh, contacts on the technical, at least, uh, basis with, with the CTBTO. Political issues, of course, kind of overshadow some of this, but at least at the technical level, I think that there's some room for, for the two bodies to, to engage further. Um, I'll stop there on the CTBT issue. Now, the, the UNSCARE, I think that's a very interesting uh, body that doesn't come up almost at all in the discussions having to do with, you know, with nuclear <coughs> nonproliferation and, and disarmament. And yet, as Tariq said, this is the authoritative body, international body, that pr produces scientific reports on the effects of radiation. It's a United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, which was established in 1955 pursuant to the UN General Assembly resolution. And its mandate is to assess and report back to member states about the levels and effects of ionizing radiation. And to do that, the committee members, there are right now 31 member states of the committee, they nominate scientists to serve as committee members. Um, then they um, collect information uh, from the UN member states from uh, international organizations, NGOs, from scientific peer-reviewed literature on different aspects of ionizing radiation and if its effects. And then they independently engage scientists to examine that data and provide their reports. They report annually to the UN General Assembly. And then to the, that report, they usually attach scientific annexes examining specific issues. Um, now, the two major reports in recent times that, that would probably draw the most attention were the uh, examination of effects of the Chernobyl accident. And there, there were different white papers and sub-reports having to do with health effects, effects on the environment, um, evaluation of radiation-induced, uh, radiation-related cancer, and some of the hereditary radi radiation effects. So, so all of that clearly has implication also for studying, for assessing the the needs uh, of, of victims of nuclear testing. And here, this would be useful to go back a little bit in the on-scale work um, uh, in the, in back several decades, actually, where they did examine the uh, impact of nuclear testing on environment and, and health, their scientific reports and, and, and annexes going back to 1964, 69, 77. I think the latest I could find was 82, but probably, it's, it's possible there, there were subsequently ones. And, and dealing specifically with exposures as a result of nuclear testing and nuclear explosions. I think here is, is a wealth of ground for the scientific engagement between the scientific advisory group and, and, and UNSCARE. Now, UNSCARE is a little bit different because it's a committee. It's established pursuant to the UN General Assembly mandate. So the committee comes up with the program of work that is then uh, endorsed by the UN General Assembly. But the UN General Assembly and member states can also put sort of on the table topics for the committee to examine. And here you have the a UN mandated TPNW that, uh, that has a scientific advisory group that can also potentially pr propose to its to states parties of the TPNW to put something on the table for the UNSCARE to examine, considering that it is the uh, authoritative body uh, dealing with scientific information on the effects of radiation. And then that can feed back into the work of the scientific advisory group and the TPNW itself with regard to devising uh, if, if there are specific ways to enhance uh, assistance provided or if we need more studies concerning the uh, impact on nuclear testing victims or nuclear use. Well, that, that hopefully we don't have any fresh victims of nuclear use to, to, to look at. So I think I'll stop here and then hopefully I made it in time and I look forward to questions. Not Thank to me, though. <laughs> <Not to> <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll get at, uh, enough time to field all the questions. But uh, the way we're going to do it uh, is, first of all, there were all, already a couple of questions to use here, and uh, we appreciate you start with that. Those, uh, I know there are two questions online that already came in, and those uh, who are in the room, if you wish to um, ask a question, I would need to see your hand, of, and please don't forget to introduce uh, yourself. I'll take these two questions for the start, and then we will see how much we can field into the remaining time. Um, Dia, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
So the questions uh, from Tarek. Um, so one reason for um, the whole commitment to capacity building and outreach from the scientific advisory group was a, a recognition of the, the unevenness of the available scientific and technical expertise um, in communities that support the goals um, of the TPNW and the implementation of the treaty. And so it's specifically to address some of these issues about who's available to support the work and to take it forward that there is this commitment as capacity building, especially in TPNW states, with a focus on both geography and gender to address that exactly the point that you made. So you know, there's no getting away from that fact. And the question of relevant expertise, that also speaks exactly to this question, that most of the expertise on nuclear weapons issues, in terms of the, the kinds of things that you and, and Laura have quite rightly talked about, resides in states that have not been you know, particularly sympathetic so far to the TPNW, but there are people in those states with technical expertise who are able to contribute to this process. And part of the goal of the scientific advisory group is to have these kinds of conversations with people and begin a collaborative process because there is a presumption that at some level there is actually a shared commitment to the underlying goals by everyone that you know, we do want to get to a world free of nuclear weapons. And you know, how can we do this together? So I think the question of relevant expertise, and if you look at the expertise actually on the current scientific advisory group, you will find people who have expertise in disarmament science, including people who work on some of the things that Laura talked about in terms of how do you authenticate you know, whether something is what it's said to be and ways where you don't have to actually take a screwdriver to it and, and open it up and deal with classified information. And one of the things that we have learned over the years is that it, is not, it should not be surprising to people that when people who live in a classified setting think about a set of questions, classification becomes a central part of how they define, view problems, and categorize solutions. When people who don't work in classified settings think about similar kinds of questions, they come up with other kinds of answers that can get you to the same place. And so I think one of the things that we have to do is to keep in mind that there are ways of addressing the questions of the authentication of nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons materials, of getting around questions of, you know, do you actually need to see nuclear weapon design and how much of that actually is as much of an obstacle as it might seem to somebody who comes from a classified perspective and all of these things. Um, the last question uh, that I had was Elena's question about IPNDV and Quad. Yeah. So we are following all of those processes, absolutely, and have been doing so. But the thing I want to emphasize is that it's important not to compress the scientific advisory group into just the nuclear weapon disarmament verification part of the work. Because the agenda is much broader than that, right? It's just that the way in which the question of nuclear disarmament has been kind of collapsed into the question of verification has its own limits about how one frames what's relevant and what's important. And a key part of the TPNW's approach is that, sure, verification of disarmament of weapon and elimination of weapon programs is a critical part of the goal of the treaty, but so is the humanitarian perspective of all this. And no amount of training in nuclear weapon physics is going to turn you into somebody with a deep humanitarian ethic. Right? It takes other kinds of experiences to do that. And so some kinds of technical expertise is relevant in all of these things. And the scientific advisory group representing the interests of the state's parties, after all, who've nominated them, aims to cover a very broad set of issues, not just disarmament verification. And so there are certainly issues where if state's parties say, we would like you to do a set of specific focus studies on this, then we will go off and do specific sets of focus studies on this. But right now, our goal is to cover the board of all the things that are of relevance to the TPNW in the broadest possible interpretation of the implementation issues and challenges, including disarmament verification, including humanitarian consequences, including the risks of nuclear weapons today, and the larger set of questions of how to advance the disarmament and non-proliferation discourse 
more broadly informed by the perspectives that come out of the TPNW. So it, you're quite right, it's asking a lot, but that also means then we can't just narrow everybody's expertise and all of our focus into just one of those things. We have to be able to do all of these things in a way that meets the needs of the state's parties, because that's ultimately the purpose of the scientific advisory group, is to help the state's parties meet the challenges that they set for themselves in taking the TPNW and the larger agenda of nuclear disarmament forward. So it is important not to kind of put it all into the traditional pillar of disarmament verification and say, well, that's really what you need to be doing. Thank you, Zia, important clarifications. I think one of the questions from online, as far as I understand, is uh, you partially answered, but maybe a, uh, I'm rephrasing it. From what I understand, there was a question about the access to the advisory board by non-TPNW states parties. Um, my understanding is when it comes to the expert uh, serving on the um, advisory uh, um, council, uh, that doesn't matter what country they come from, right? Correct. So the right. states, parties that to the TPNW nominate members of the scientific advisory group. There is no requirement as such that they have to be citizens of that particular state party. So for example, I am not, yeah. right? Uh, it does say that they have to be people who have recognized expertise in issues relevant to the TPNW and based in an academic setting, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's part of the requirement. And so, yeah, we can, we, we do have members from countries. Um, and if you look on the, membership is available, it's not a secret. Yeah. Uh, you can find it both on the UN ODA website and on ICANN's website of who the members are. And you will see that there are people who are, you know, originally citizens and trained in Germany and in France and, and, and in the UK. United States and the UK. So it's, that's not, a, it's not an issue. Did I get the question right, Louis? More or less. What is the other question? Because well, if you don't mind. So just so people can mind. So the first question was whether non-TPNW states parties could put a specific inquiry to the advisory board. Mm -hmm. um, the second question was um, Norway and Sweden, both observers uh, to the first uh, MSP, were greatly in, are greatly engaged in nuclear disarmament verification in the Quad, in the um, IPNDV. And um, what is it that they can do to strengthen um, Article 4 on disarmament verification as non-states parties. Okay. Uh, Zia, would you like to tackle that one as well? Sure. You know, it's or a, anyone else? <laughs> so in terms of the first part of it, the question about whether TPNW non-states parties can send questions to um, the scientific advisory group, sure, they can write to us and say, you know, what do you think of this? You, here is a proposal, here is a question. And because we have autonomy to think about things that the group thinks are important. And if we think that actually this is really interesting and important question that TPNW states parties should also think about, then we could take that up. It doesn't require that the questions must come from a state party. I mean, and we are open to input from anybody to say, look, these are interesting things. Can we talk to you about this? Um, the, the issue is that when states' parties ask things, then we are obliged to respond to those and to say, yeah, this is how to respond to this, because we are, in that sense, established for the purposes of supporting TPNW states' parties. But as an advisory group with autonomy to be able to pursue things that we think are of importance to nuclear disarmament and to the goals and implementation of the TPNW, we can take input from anyone and then try and think about how we want to take that forward in an appropriate way and communicate that understanding to states' parties. So that is fine. And similarly with the question of Norway and so on, that it would be great if they wanted to engage with TPNW states and that you know at the next MSP, if they wanted to come and provide input and advice and experience about how they've been thinking about this and how it specifically advances the TPNW's goals of the 
elimination of nuclear weapon programs in a time-bound, irreversible, verifiable way, then I think that would be a conversation that you know, people would find interesting. Thank you, Zia. I'm going to move to our uh, to questions here in the auditorium. Um, please introduce yourself, and if you have a spe question specific to one of the panelists or to the entire panel, please indicate so, Nina. So you. my question is also to Zia, so why don't I pass um, to see if there are questions uh, on other topics? Sorry, right? you need to speak in the microphone, because otherwise yeah, it's, it's okay, Caroline. we'll be able to hear you. Okay. Oh, and we passed. Yeah. Uh, in the back, there was uh, somebody. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh. It's only for the online audience. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, uh, thank you for your informative uh, presentation. And uh, I'm Shun Oshita from the Permanent Mission in Japan. I am attending this meeting as a, as a to completely in individual capacity. So uh, my, my opinion is not the Japanese government. Okay, thank you. Okay, and uh, my question is about uh, uh, whether a new inter to establish a new international organization can be a feasible option for TPNW, like the OPCW uh, established by the Convention on the Prohibition of uh, uh, Chemical Weapons. And the second one is about uh, nuclear disarmament verification. Uh, as Ms. Uh, Lockwood said, the IAEA has the experience in South Africa about the nuclear disarmament. But on the other hand, the establishment to, st establishment to store the nuclear weapons and related facilities in the existing uh, nuclear weapons states are a bit different from the, the home, the facilities which were in South Africa to store the nuclear weapons. So uh, I am wondering whether and how much extent the experience of the IAEA can be applied to the disarmament verification in the US, Russia, and other states possessing their nuclear weapons. Thank you. I think all, all good questions. <laughs> uh, anyone would like to, from the panel, to take any of these questions? One on a possibility of a separate organization and the second one about the different type of facilities that are in the nuclear weapon states that uh, the agency may not have had experience of dealing with in contrast with South Africa. I saw Tarek, you wanted to chime in and others if you wish. So the IAEA does have experience in verifying uh, enrichment plants even in nuclear weapon states, for example in China. They got an uh, enrichment plant from uh, Russia, which is under verification, albeit it produces civilian material. Uh, but you've raised an interesting question, and this concerns, the, in the South Africa example, the South Africans were extremely transparent, and they provided all the records, and the agency, as um, Laura mentioned, was able to verify the production records. In my view, this will not be the case in the nine nuclear states with uh, weapons. Uh, for example, the United States made a complete declaration of its uh, plutonium and its HEU inventories under the Clinton administration, uh, Secretary Hazel O'Leary. So according to one of their declarations, the U.S. had produced 113.4 metric tons of plutonium from 1945 till they stopped. And of that, 2.8 or 2.9 metric tons is material unaccounted for or inventory difference. And they also produced between 620 to 740 metric tons of highly enriched uranium. And there the inventory dif difference is 3.2 metric tons. A metric ton is 1,000 kilograms. For the IAEA, a significant quantity is 25 kilograms of HEU and 8 of plutonium. So in the early years, neither the United States nor the Soviet Union kept good records. Even in Canada, which is my country, where the plutonium was made for the first device, there are still solutions that are buried underground uh, that we don't know what's in them. Same is the case at Hanford and elsewhere. So those will never be able to be verified for a variety of reasons that we don't have time to go into. So my point here is that we will never be able to get 100% confidence in verification of nuclear disarmament and uh, denuclearization in nine countries with nuclear uh, weapons. But on the other hand, maybe we don't need 100% uh, confidence. We can uh, do with something less where we can, still be, we can still ensure that there is no revitalization of nuclear weapon programs. 
Thank you, Tariq. Maybe add just to, to that point is that, in principle, um, it's hard for me to judge the IA verification. Maybe they do require 100% which is probably also not the case, because what they do is sometimes take some of the roads rather than checking all of the whatever hundred of them. And uh, I don't think there is a, a verification regime that exists or exists that has this 100%. It's always there is the uh, some degree of confidence that that satisfies the parties. So I agree with you. That the right of agency says, based on the information available to it, there is no indication. Yeah. So it's never 100 percent full. Same proof. for the U.S.-Russian uh, arms control yeah. agreement and many but others. But the TPNW opponents mm -hmm. want to raise this thing of 100 percent verification. If you don't have 100 percent verification, the TPNW is useless and chuck it in the garbage bin. Oh. <laughs> Who wants to address the uh, possibility of a separate organization rather than I? I think that was the question. Or. Um, Maybe it's thinking, yeah. I, Laura? You know, my, my, my view is if, if we're going to get, I think the IA has a natural place in the area of uh, verifying the non-diversion of the nuclear material that is released from the weapons programs. But I'd love to hear from you guys what you see about this, uh, and forgive me, the competent international agency. Do you see it as a separate agency being set up um, and funded by the state's parties. But how much uh, of that was debated in the actual negotiation of the treaty? But I think, I think, I don't think the agency should be tasked with all of it. Do we have an answer or is this is something okay. to? Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, Galpar wants to chime in. I mean, if you, hmm? no, you go first, I'll add a postscript. Yeah. <laughs> No well, uh, the, the question of whether we would need a separate organization rather than the IA certainly did come up in the, in the run-up to the negotiations, uh, in the negotiations themselves. And as, uh, as Ambassador Higgy mentioned earlier, um, it was well beyond the, the negotiating parties to work out all the details of how dismantlement of nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons programs will, will uh, proceed and be verified in the absence of the actual weapons possessors. And so that is why there was this consideration. We want to make sure that there's a door open for nuclear possessing states to join. Uh, we don't want to put it only uh, at the very end, which was one option, sort of the South Africa Plus, where uh, it would have been probably enough to choose to just designate the IA to verify the, nu the nuclear material in the end. Uh, but since there was a, a recognition that, that maybe we'd, we'd want nuclear possessors to join earlier in the process, and then and then there was a recognition that the IEA may not be the right organization to verify the process as it's happening. Uh, but again, the, ver the, the, the working out of the details of who it should be, uh, what this organization should look like, that wasn't up for the negotiating parties to do in the short amount of time that they had. And considering also political aspects of we, we don't necessarily want to try to extend the mandate to, to prolong the negotiations for years. The main focus from the beginning of the TPNW is the normative aspect to establish the norm. And so it was a very, I think, conscious decision by the, by the negotiators to, um, to leave the details of specifically wh what the organization verifying the process of the summit would look like. Um, for, for, for later, and I think that's part of the reason there is a scientific advisory group is to consider some of these things and provide advice to, to state parties um, as they continue thinking about, about that. Okay. Postscript. Yeah. Yes, and it's not exactly uh, as if there's a burning need to deal with this issue right now, sadly. Um, it is on the plate of the intercessional process, the informal working group that's dealing with Article 4 issues, but they're working through, I think their priority is working through verification aspects necessary for Route 1 or Route 2, and haven't yet uh, addressed the question of international organisation, and may not for some time, given the lack of, a, of an actual practical need. Um, I was keen to... Um, 
grab the microphone because I wanted to ask a question. I thought this was a way of cunningly gazumping some of you and getting priority to ask you a question. May I? Sure. Oh, thank you. Of course. Um, you said, Zia, that um, the SAG, to call it that, I refuse to call it SAG, that's rather pejorative, um, <laughs> that a focus would be on engaging experts from the broadest number of institutions and the broadest range of scientists so that the SAG was plugged into the widest possible scientific network. And it seems to me tragic if you can't plug into um, the independent-minded scientists who are experts in this field and the IAEA, and yes, the IAEA um, employees are employees of an international organisation, but you know, scientists are supposed to have an independent spirit. Um, can you engage with any of them, any of them? Okay. Um, <laughs> wouldn't it be great if the SAG could engage in the spirit of working out the best science on these really crucially important issues, if the SAG could engage with relevant scientists in the, I, in the IAEA, wouldn't that be great? It would be great. But it ain't happening, <laughs> okay. And Thank it, you. It, and the obstacle is not on our side. No. Um, no. But it's a question of how much autonomy scientists have within institutions and who decides who they're allowed to talk to and about what and under what conditions and to what end. But let me just add one thing on the previous question, if I might, since it does come up and it is important. And that is that the TPNW takes a really interesting approach to the question of you know, uh, this competent authority and the disarmament verification. Uh, with regard to the elimination of weapon programs, in that the first responsibility is that of the state party to prepare its own plan for meeting its obligation that it has accepted for itself. And that plan is required to meet the goals, the targets of being legally binding, as, as Dell mentioned, verifiable, time-bound plan for the elimination of its own nuclear weapon program. So first of all, the state must decide for itself that this is how we anticipate and feel that we will actually fulfill our own obligation that we are undertaking as a treaty party. And so that has the benefit in that the competent authority or authorities then have to deal with the plan that the state submits and says, you know, here is where we think it meets or doesn't meet the targets as we understand them. So let's negotiate on those details. So it's not a question that the competent authority has a template that, you know, this is the safeguards box that you have to get into. So how are you get in to, to get into it? The state has to decide first for itself that this is how we anticipate being able to meet the goal of being irreversible, time-bound, legally binding plan for the elimination of our nuclear weapon program. That's a really fascinating point. I think that's, you know, the, you're not starting from let's establish a template, but rather make it tailored to the state concern. Yeah. Interesting. As much as I would love to continue, we're way past the time we were supposed to end. But so I will. I gesamt the question. <laughs> <laughs> but I would allow. Uh, uh, a, Tariq wanted to chime in something, and if any of our panelists want to add something as a like 30 seconds to what they have uh, touched upon, or um, that something else uh, was br brought by other panelists or during the questions. That will let's do it, and then we will have to unfortunately close. Tarek. Thank you. So I have an uncomfortable question for TPNW states parties. The, the scientific advisory group says members of the panel shall receive no salary for their service. This is yet another example where states parties are relying on NGOs to subsidize expertise. You should really compensate the experts for their time. 
I mean, foreign ministry people don't work for free, so why do states parties expect NGO experts to work for free? Um, yeah, this is a fair point. Yeah, I mean, this is always the case. I mean, uh, we just came from a meeting where, again, NGO expertise was on display. We didn't see much expertise from states parties. Okay, uh, I prefer that the IAEA, if it was given the resources and the mandate, would be able to do the job because there's no point duplicating much of the work. The IAEA already does verification under voluntary offer agreements in some uh, civilian facilities in nuclear weapons states. We don't want to have two competing jurisdictions on nuclear weapons issues. So uh, as I mentioned, there needs to, we need to fix the governance structure a, a little bit. Uh, and um, I'm very glad that the current Director General has shown um, more initiative than in the previous times in allowing agency staff to come to TPNW meetings, to the Middle East Nuclear Weapon Free Zone meetings, and I think it's perfectly legitimate uh, the uh, TPNW has 68 states parties. Each and every one is an IAEA member state. So they have a perfect right to ask the IAEA to work on TPNW issues. And as regards uh, IAEA uh, scientists and safeguards people engaging with the, uh, with the group and others, during my time, I got authority from the Director General to authorize IAEA inspectors to go to CTBTO technical meetings, particularly on radionuclides, where they were looking at things called muons and antineutrino, because they were very, because there is a non relationship between the two organizations. So we created a mechanism by which uh, safeguard staff could attend not only meetings at the CTBTO, but at Darmstadt and other places where there were. Well, there were technical discussions. So since the Director General comes from a non-nuclear weapon state, from the first nuclear weapon free zone area, Argentina, I'm sure that if approached, uh, he would find a way to uh, make it possible for agency staff to engage with the, the advisory group and, and others in, in some format or another. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Laura, you can tell? Last points, comments? Money for NGOs? <laughs> sorry, sorry, I didn't bring my checkbook. <laughs> um, yes, it's a fair point, but you know, governments are always mingy and watching the bottom line, and yeah, the choice is often between a free NGO and nothing at all, and which in that context. So that means creating a new organization. I mean, Director General Ed Grossi had to fight to get 12 million euros in January for the budget to compensate for inflation. That's, you know, peanuts, not even a rounding error. So, and so just on your other point about the Director General, you could ask yourself where Argentina sits on the TPNW. That's an interesting question. That's what we But ask. also, um, Laura mentioned the potential choke point of the bog, of the Board of Governors. I'd like to think that the Director General is gonna forge out on a brave new path but the Board of Governors has got to be persuaded. No, so the Director General can take initiatives when okay. he wants to. The pre uh, uh, one the Director General, one of those under whom R Laura and I worked, did take initiatives to the chagrin of some member states. Uh, the agency was approached by two nuclear weapon states not to send a representative to the signing of the Central Asian Nuclear Weapon Free Zone Treaty. We had decided to send a Deputy Director General, and we did so. Okay, That's I think a little we bit can continue the yeah. discussion yeah. after a little bit yeah. less low. <laughs> can I just give the uh, 30 seconds floor if you Zia wants to say something sure. towards the end? Yeah, and then Gauhar and we need to close. So I, let me just say one thing about this. One of the key attributes of the scientific community as a community has been it is fundamentally transnational and it crosses institutional barriers. Mm -hmm. There's never been an issue with scientists talking to other scientists. Even in the height of the Cold War, the US and Soviet scientists were able to talk to each other despite what the policies of their governments were. Similarly, people within countries talk to each other as scientists across institutional barriers. The question is just to find the means and the mechanism because the scientists do see themselves by and large as a community seeing a common goal that they seek to pursue and that you will find scientists committed to the goals that underlie the TPNW within nuclear weapon laboratories and across national boundaries. It's just a question of 
creating the mechanisms and the means to allow those conversations to go forward. I think you won't find a problem with getting the scientists to talk to each other. Thank you. Gauhar? I think that's a great way to finish. Great way to finish. <laughs> Fully subscribe to that, uh, to that point about scientists being able to, uh, to find uh, ways to communicate with, uh, with each other and contribute to the process. Um, to, the cl to close the uh, event, I wanted to say a few things. One is uh, it's definitely a very interesting topic that we raised today and, and put on the agenda. And you saw how many different dimensions to it exist. Um, uh, obviously, we just scratched the surface of the various dimensions related to the scientific, technical, uh, part of the further work on verification and other aspects of the treaties and the consequences. We, we started the discussion about potential nexus with different organizations, at least the three organizations that we highlighted today. And that's also really a beginning of the uh, conversation, not, not the end of it, some of the suggestions that were put forward today. And um, I learned a lot. And I wanted to first uh, the, uh, to um, wish you and uh, Patricia and all the members of the scientific advisory group to uh, you know, success in your endeavors. Uh, please, we would be happy to at some point hear a briefing on uh, or learn more about some of the work you are doing. And I'm uh, looking forward to engaging with many of you if you have suggestions or ideas. But at this moment, I really want to first and foremost to thank our panelists. Um, they were fabulous and provided us some rich information and food for thought. But also to thank the Austrian Foreign Ministry for their support to our uh, seminar series. And to uh, all of you who found um, themselves here in the afternoon during the finally beautiful weather in Vienna. Uh, and those who watch us online, thank you all. And until next time. Mm-hmm.